the Great Barrier Reef is dead. That was this message of this article I found a few months ago while I was browsing the internet looking for news on the last global bleaching event. It was a federalistic attempt to try to raise awareness of the dire state of our coral reefs. The Great Barrier Reef is not dead, not yet at least, but it is in serious trouble, like all our reefs are. The last global bleaching event triggered by the El Niño 2015 has ravaged reefs all around the world. In the Great Barrier Reef alone, it has killed more than 20% of the corals, and other places have been hit even harder, such as the Sekisei Lagoon in Japan, where more than 70% of the corals died. Reports from all over the world paint a very similar picture. Now, the problem is this was not a singular event. This was not a one-time thing. We now expect 99% of the coral reefs to experience annual bleaching before the end of the century. What we're facing is the loss of one of the most productive and important ecosystems of our planet, but also one of the most beautiful ones, as you can see from the stunning photograph taken by my colleague and uh, truly gifted photographer, Tani Sinkler from the Reef Ecology Lab here at Kaust. But you see, corals are not just pretty. They sustain the livelihood of hundreds of millions of people around the world. They are fishing grounds and nurseries for many economically important fish species. They are the basis of the tourist industry and a major source of income for many countries. They even provide services most people wouldn't even think about. They protect our shorelines from storm and erosion by breaking the waves before they hit the shore. They're even sources of new medicines against cancer and other diseases. And, and although they only cover about 0.1% of the ocean floor. They support more than 25% of all marine fish and a myriad of invertebrate species. But what are corals? I mean, I get asked this quite often. I meet people who think they're plants. Some even think they're just rocks. But no, they're not. They're animals, and they belong to a group we scientists call cnidarians. They're named after these stinging cells that many of them use to catch their prey. And I presume some of you might have made some first-hand experience during an unfortunate encounter with jellyfish. Now, many corals actually live in colonies, as you can see here in this wonderful picture taken by my colleague Eric Tambute from the Centre Scientifique in Monaco. These colonies can have hundreds and even thousands of polyps, and these polyps look a bit like upside-down jellyfish. And like jellyfish, they use the tentacles to grab food from the surrounding water. But unlike jellyfish and many other cnidarians, such as anemones, corals actually make a skeleton. While the colony grows, these polyps keep adding layer by layer of limestone, building the structure of the reefs. Structures so big that you can even see them from space. This is the case with the Great Barrier Reef, which, by the way, is also the largest structure on Earth built by living organisms. And these structures are then the home for all the other animals, the fish, the crabs, the mollusks, and all the creatures that live on a reef. But why do corals bleach? And what is bleaching anyways? Well, to understand that, we first need to know what makes corals so special. You see, for most people, the crystal clear waters of the tropics are the epitome of pristine oceans. We all know these pictures in the travel agencies, these tropical island paradises surrounded by clear blue water. But what most people don't realize is that this crystal clear water is actually an ocean desert. It is so clear because it hardly contains any nutrients and cannot sustain a lot of life. So how come corals are able to build one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in such an environment? Now, here's a fun fact. One of the most famous scientists to ponder about this question was Charles Darwin. During his famous travel on the research ship Beagle, he traveled the world and studied the different types of reefs, the fringing reefs and barrier reefs and the tolls, and he wanted to understand how corals were able to create these structures. He even wrote one of his most famous scientific monographs on the topic, The Structure and Distribution of Coral Reefs. He literally marveled at how these tiny polyps 
could build structures that defied the forces of the oceans, forces that would turn rock to rubble. Yet these organisms would just diligently grow and grow and build these structures in an environment that should not support it. How is this possible? Well, they literally carry the secret inside of them. Corals have an association with photosynthetic algae that live inside the tissues. You can see this here in this photo in bright red. The red color comes from the fluorescence of the chlorophyll, the photosynthetic pigment these algae carry. Now, these algae can use sunlight to produce energy-rich carbs that they give to the coral. And in return, the coral provides them with shelter and nutrients. But this is, of course, not all there is to the story. After all, we know that carbs alone don't make for a healthy diet. Now, the trick is that this association also allows the coral to efficiently recycle its waste products. It basically uses the waste as a fertilizer for the algae. The algae recycles it and gives it back in form of amino acids and other nutrients. This is what makes corals so nutrient efficient and allows them to actually thrive in this environment. Ironically, it is also their Achilles heel. As is often the case with very intimate relationships, it, they can break down if put under stress. And for reasons we don't yet fully understand, the relationship between corals and their algae is quite sensitive. High temperatures, low temperatures, too much light, pollution, all these things can trigger the breakdown of this association. And in response, the corals expel the symbionts and their tissue turns ghostly white, as you can see here in this amazing picture from Tani, showing actually an anemone. But that's okay, anemone are close relatives of corals and they have the same symbionts. And as you can see, they also bleach. Now, bleaching itself is not unnatural. And it's also not a big deal if a colony bleaches or if you colony bleach. It starts to become a problem, however, if you have an entire reef bleach, like you can see in this picture taken during one of the bleaching surveys in the Great Barrier Reef. In this state, the coral basically lost its main source of food. They literally starve. They can survive for some time depending on the energy reserves they have, but if the stress is not alleviated, if the temperatures don't go back down and allow them to take up new symbionts, they eventually die. Their skeletons get overgrown by algae and the ecosystem is dead. Now, over time, such a dead reef can, of course, be restored. Coral larvae from other reefs can come, settle, build new colonies. But this takes time, a lot of it, because corals are pretty slow growers. The fastest species grow a few centimeters per year, but many of the big, massive colonies just grow a few millimeters. So you can imagine that it can take decades and hundreds of years to restore such a reef. Now imagine we're not talking about just a reef bleaching, but many, maybe even most reefs in an entire region, or as is the case with a global bleaching event, all over the world. We basically disable the intrinsic healing mechanisms of these ecosystems. So, given our current prognosis of the increase in frequency and severity of such mass bleaching events, it doesn't look good for corals. Or what should we do? Should we give up? I don't think so. I think it is now more important than ever to do everything we can, to put in all the effort to save these ecosystems. And there's even a sliver of hope, actually several. Sometimes you find these odd survivors, these colonies that despite the demise of their fellows, somehow appear to be less affected. Like this guy here, captured by my colleague Greg Torder from the Australian Institute of Marine Science during one of his surveys. We even know entire regions where corals have naturally adapted to high temperature such as right here in the Red Sea. The Red Sea is one of the hottest bodies of water, yet corals thrive under these conditions. Red Sea corals have learned to cope with high temperature. As you can see here in this stunning picture from Tani showing our house reef ship Nazar just off coast. For us researchers, these are unique opportunities. These places allow us to study how corals can adapt to such conditions and to maybe understand if corals in other places could adapt in a similar way to climate change. 
It doesn't mean that Red Sea corals are immune, that they don't bleach, because they do. As you can see here in this sad picture, taken by PhD student Terry Rotick from the Reef Genomics Lab here at Kaust, was taken in 2015 during the global bleaching event. Still, Red Sea corals came today already with stand temperatures that are pretty close to what we would call the worst case scenario for the end of the century in other places, like the Great Barrier Reef or the Caribbean. So for us researchers, these are indeed unique opportunities. But more importantly, the fact that Red Sea corals can deal with these temperatures tells us two very important things. First, it's generally possible. And second, adaptations to high temperatures already exist, meaning that places like the Red Sea could act as a source for such adaptation that could be shared with corals from other places. This would mean these other corals would not have to evolve these adaptations from scratch, a process that could take hundreds and maybe thousands of years. This is what we are studying at the moment, identifying these adaptations so we can go out there and see if they're already present. If maybe these odd survivors, like the one I just showed you, survive because they already carry these adaptations. So the future of coral reef research at the moment, I would say, is both exciting and sad. Exciting because we can now ask all these questions. Uh, the technological advances allow us to now sequence entire genomes in mere days, and we have the computational power to actually compare these sequences, do this analysis in order to hopefully identify the adaptations so that we can go out there and see if they're present. But at the same time, we don't know if this will be enough to help corals. And what if we find out that they cannot be shared or that it would take too long not allowing corals from other regions to actually keep pace with climate change, which is happening at unprecedented speeds. What should we do? Should we think about more drastic measures, like taking corals from the Red Sea and bringing them to the world, to other places? Should we maybe think about breeding our own temperature-resilient corals? Or more drastic measures, like making our own genetically modified Franken corals? How far should we go? How far can we go? These are all questions that we have to ask ourselves and decisions that we might have to make in the near future. So what we need now, more than anything, I would say, is time. Time for the corals so they can do their thing, so they can naturally adapt. Time for us to better understand them, to see how we can help them best. But also time to come to the right conclusion. So that when we get to the point, we can make the right, the wise choice. You see, all of these measures can have drastic effects. Taking a coral from the Red Sea and introducing it in an environment where it doesn't belong can have fatal consequences for this ecosystem. Making a temperature-resilient coral could give us, yes, a coral that doesn't bleach when the temperature rises, but maybe is more sensitive to other factors or to local diseases. After all, there's no free lunch. Everything comes at a cost, and the trade-offs are unpredictable. So yes, we need time, but time is the one thing we scientists cannot give them. But you can, or better said, we all can. By becoming a bit more environmentally friendly, by actively trying to reduce our carbon footprint, by making choices for sustainable alternatives whenever possible. And by supporting and maybe even demanding policies that protect our environment. I truly believe that this is a chance for everybody to contribute and to make a difference in order to help and preserve this ecosystem so that our children's children can benefit from them like we do. So that they can actually go out there and witness their beauty with their own eyes, instead of having to learn about them from books or movies, or TEDx talks for that matter. After all, it's not about saving corals, at least not only. It's about us. It's about us and about preserving a sustainable, functional Earth for future generations. 
I know that many of you, I guess even most, will think that whatever you can do is insignificant in light of the sheer scale of the problem that we're facing. I mean, what can you do? What contribution can you make to fight climate change? But you know what? Just like every tiny polyp contributes only a small part to the bigger whole, in their sum, they create one of the wonders of the world. They truly make an impact. And so can you. Thank you very much. <laughs>